afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Ned Bellavance, uh, founder of Ned in the Cloud LLC, and there's a lot of gobbledygook on there using OIDC with HashiCorp Vault and GitHub Actions. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to start back with a central premise, which is that static credentials are terrible and you should never use them. And that's my talk. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not. Uh, why are they terrible? I got to put some some reasoning around this, right? I can't just say static credentials suck. Um, there's a bunch of reasons why they're not good. Well, the first reason is they can leak. And I mean, any credential can leak, right? But the problem with static credentials is they're not changing. They're not generated automatically. So if they leak, they're probably going to stay in force for a while. Because if you think about it, the average time it takes for an organization to realize that something's been leaked and compromised is like six months to like two years. Um, so that's not good on its own. Um, the next thing is that static credentials, assuming you've set them to expire, which you probably should, uh, they expire. And if you're not sure everywhere they're being used or you forget a workflow to update them, kind of like an expired certificate, then things break. So you're like, yeah, everything's going great. And then your static credential times out. And of course, it's going to do it on a Sunday at like 9 p.m. or something. And you've got to get on and your page blows up, all that kind of stuff. You know, that's bad, too. And the other thing is usually static credentials are kind of hard to come by. So your application team requests some credentials for a database. And it took three weeks to get a provision because it had to go through the infrastructure team. And it had to go through the security team. And then all the way back through, you finally get your credential. And you're like, well, I'm not going to go through that nonsense again. Next time I need credentials, I'm just going to reuse the credentials. That's fine, right? Not, not great. And that gets back to the expiration problem. So if those credentials were provisioned for you, and they're good for 90 days, and then you're supposed to roll them, well, if you loan them out to a bunch of other people, then all of their applications are going to break in 90 days, and they won't know why. So static credentials, we don't like them. Dynamic's better because it's dynamic, right? I, I, I think I could just stop there. Dynamic is awesome. It means things are moving fast. I like it. Uh, but let me I'll put some context around that. Dynamic is good because it's fresh. Generally speaking, dynamic credentials are provisioned on demand. I need access to this database. OK, boom, here's some credentials. They're good for the next. 90 minutes, you do the thing you need to do, and then the credentials expire and they're no longer in use. Now, that might not work for everything, right? But if you're an admin who needs access to tweak something, you need to get into a server via SSH or anything along those lines, those temporary credentials are great. And you don't have to worry about them leaking because they're going to expire in 30 minutes anyway. And that's the big thing. Just like static credentials, they expire, but you're doing that intentionally and with the forethought that I'm expecting these credentials to expire, and so I need a workflow by which I can get new credentials whenever I happen to need them. And the last thing is that they're generally going to be single use because you have a process to dynamically get those credentials. So you think about the typical workflow where I put in a ticket in JIRA or whatever ticketing system you have. That goes to the ops team who then needs to talk to the security team. And the security team goes all the way back through. It's two, three weeks later. You're still waiting on those credentials. With Dynamic, you set up an automated way to provision credentials as you need them. And for that reason, you can get them on demand for different applications, and they're not going to be the same credentials every time. So that gets us away from the, it expired on 16 different apps at the same time, and everybody's panicking because they don't know why they can't reach the database. So that's why I like Dynamic. The problem with Dynamic is <clears throat> the problem of secret zero. And if you not, haven't heard the term secret zero before, I'm going to put a little plug in because uh, HashiCorp has the HashiCast. And on the HashiCast, they do uh, some episodes called Keeping It Secure. So recommend listening to those episodes. And they talk about secret zero a lot. But basically, the idea is, who do you trust to provision those credentials? Because if I have an automated process that needs to provision dynamic credentials, well, that process needs to be able to authenticate somehow to the system. So I need to trust whatever is doing that provisioning, which might mean I need to give it static credentials and crap, we're, we're back where we started, right? So how do you 
trust a system to dynamically provision credentials without giving it its own set of static credentials. That's the thing that we're trying to get away from in the first place. And to give this a little clearer context, I want to put this in the uh, realm of what I'm gonna be demonstrating, which is GitHub Actions and Vault. So I'm assuming at least some of you have used GitHub Actions before. If you haven't, it's basically a way of putting workflows into your repository and then having those workflows get triggered when something happens to the repository. So maybe when a push happens to the repository or a pull request comes in, there's a bunch of different actions we don't have, or a bunch of different triggers. We don't have to get into all of them. And then that workflow will do something. And there's a bunch of pre-existing actions that are out there that you can borrow. One of those is retrieving a secret from Vault. That's kind of nice. So if my GitHub Actions is provisioning an application, I can grab the application API key or the secrets that app uses from Vault. Or if it's a Terraform script, then I mean, if anybody recognizes me, you might know I like Terraform like a little bit. Like, a, I'm known to like it. Uh, if I'm using Terraform to provision infrastructure in GCP or AWS or whatever, instead of having static credentials in my GitHub Actions, wouldn't it be great if I could talk to Vault and have it just dynamically provision a credential for me? That'd be nice. But I still need GitHub Actions to be able to authenticate to Vault to provision those dynamic credentials, and now we're back to secret zero. Crap, okay, so what, what are my options for authentication? Well, until recently, one option was you could generate a GitHub personal access token and use the GitHub authentication method on Vault. But that meant you now have a static credential, which is the personal access token, and you probably want to set it to expire at some point, so you have to renew it, which means your GitHub Actions workflow is going to break at some point if you forget to renew that personal access token. So, Kind of the same problem we're having, we had before. It's not dynamic, don't love it, but it's an option. Another option is to use the app role authentication method in Vault. So for those who are not familiar with app role, it's kind of like the machine version, version of username and password. So instead of a username, you have a role ID, and that's static, it just stays the same. And then instead of a password, you have a secret. And so, as you can imagine, the secret is probably pretty important, and it's generally set for a certain number of uses, which means you either have to generate a secret for your role that is going to last a really long time, well, that sounds like a static credential again, or you have to have some external automation process outside of GitHub Actions that's provisioning the secret for the role ID that you're going to use in GitHub Actions which gets us back to secret zero again, because what does that external automation process use to generate the secret ID that you're passing to GitHub Actions to get your credentials for GCP? And my mind hurts. Okay, so there's gotta be another way. What else we got? Ooh, this is a good one. Okay, if you happen to be running your own self-hosted runners for GitHub Actions, and again, if you haven't used GitHub Actions, just backing up a second, GitHub Actions, run on a runner, a worker node, that executes your workflows. And if you don't specify a self-hosted runner, you can use one of the public runners that GitHub has available to you at no extra charge. If you are running self-hosted runners, that means you can put them in AWS or Azure or Google, and you can associate that instance with an identity in that cloud provider. So I'm going to say Azure because some of you may know I dabble in Azure from time to time. So if we're talking about Azure, you can associate an MSI or a managed security identity with the virtual machine that's running my GitHub Actions. And then I can use that authentication method on Vault to authenticate to Vault. So ooh, we got one. This is a good one. I'm running it on this virtual machine in Azure, and it uses its credentials to authenticate to Vault, and we're perfect, right? It's, it's dynamic, and I'm using the trust that exists between Azure and the virtual machines that are provisions. That's pretty good. The only real downside to that is when that machine authenticates, you have to give it a broad enough policy to do anything that you might happen to execute using GitHub Actions, which means you might have to give it overly broad permissions on the Vault side. So out of all these options, 
I like Cloud IAM the best because I have that, in, that trust between the cloud provider and the virtual machine or container where I'm running my GitHub Actions. But I might have to give over broad permissions, so it's not great. So this is the whole point of the talk, right? Oh, we got to the meat. The solution, naturally, is OIDC and JWT, which is pronounced JOT, which makes my heart happy because I'm from Philadelphia, and we say John, and it's very close. So I like saying JOT. Um, but if you've never heard that terminology before, you're like, well, JOT, what? It's JWT. It's pronounced JOT because that's, that's how we do. So the solution here, the potential solution to my problem is using OIDC, which is Open ID Connect, and JSON Web Tokens. And JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, so you have an acronym inside of an acronym, which is fun. We're not going to go into full detail of what OIDC is and what JOT is, because honestly, we don't have the next three hours, or I think some of the other speakers might complain if I took up the next three hours. So instead, we're just going to dig into how it kind of works in our context. So let me take you through the workflow of how the JOT style authentication would work to give access to a client. So we'll set up three different things. We've got our client. That's the thing that wants access to something. We have our authentication server. That's going to help with that access. And then we have the actual resource server that has the thing that we want to access. So that's our, our three, uh, three objects. The first step in the process is that the client requests a token from the authentication server. This is the JOT. This is what it's receiving. So the client's going to make that request. The authentication server and the authentication server, after it does a little homework, will return a JWT, a JOT, back to that client. Now, it is turtles all the way down, I'm not going to lie. There has to be a trust relationship between that client and the authentication server. So however that trust is established, maybe they're both within the same service, as which is the case with GitHub Actions, or maybe you're running this internally somehow. The client and the authentication server have to have some form of trust between each other. But once it has that token, now it's ready to ask for permissions to access something on the resource server. And the way it starts that flow is it presents its JOT to the resource server, and the resource server goes, hmm, I like this, I like this token, this looks good, but I'm going to have to check. You know, trust but verify, right? So it's going to send that token over to the authentication server and say, did you issue this token? Just want to make sure. And the authentication server will say, yeah, yeah, I did. And then the resource server will be very happy, and it will generate a new token that is passed to the client for access to whatever that resource is. And it's usually going to be a token, right? Uh, or it could be a credential, depending on the workflow. Now, how does this map to our situation where we're working with GitHub Actions? Let's swap out our three components here. So the client, in this case, is the Actions worker. That's what is requesting the token from GitHub and then passing that token to our vault server, which is the resource we're trying to access. So on GitHub, there's a token service, and there's an implicit trust between the actions worker and GitHub's token service, GitHub OIDC. And it establishes that either by running on one of the public runners, or if you're running a self-hosted runner, there's a shared token and a bunch of other fancy gobbledygook. Like I said, it is turtles all the way down when it comes to authentication. But there's that implicit trust between them. The action worker asks for a token and sort of identifies, this is the repository that I'm executing stuff on. This is the branch that I'm doing. It provides information, and then the token service validates that information, gives it the token. The action worker then presents the vault server with the token, and the vault server needs to have an authentication method, a JOT authentication method, to verify that the token makes sense and matches up with a role defined inside of that authentication method. And then it's going to verify that token against GitHub's token service. And then if everything looks good, it'll issue a new token that has a policy associated with it in vault. And then our actions worker can access something in vault. So I know it's a lot of steps. We're going to walk through it again with a, with a demonstration. So don't worry if you didn't catch all that, though there will be a quiz later. I just want to let everybody know that. They're, the tests are in the back, and we're going to hand them out. Okay? you got to get 80% or you're not allowed to leave the room. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. OK, so what is actually in this JOT that is issued by the GitHub uh, token service? 
there's a bunch of fields in here. I truncated this heavily. Um, if you look at, look at a dump of the whole thing, it's, it's a lot of information. Um, but instead of trying to look at this eye chart of information, let's break it down to the three key fields that you'll actually care about if you're trying to set up the authentication method on the vault side. And <clears throat> this is the claim fields. So when I say claim fields, I'm just talking about JSON fields in the JWT. Don't let the terminology throw you. Um, if you came from the world of like ADFS, some of this might sound kind of familiar and you're like, dear God, get me out of this hell. It's not that. This is a little bit nicer. So claim fields, what do we got? We got the subject. This identifies the subject of the token. This is who was issued the token. And in the case of GitHub Actions to, <clears throat> excuse me, tokens, it's going to be the repository, which is going to be the user or the organization and then the repository name. And then it's also going to be a reference. That reference could be to a, a specific branch that's doing the deployment. It could also be specific to a pull request, um, or I believe you can also do specific tags. So it depends on how the uh, request comes in from an actions perspective, but it's going to be a reference of some regard to that repository and which branch. The next big field you need to know about is the audience field. The audience field is the recipient of the token. And you would think that the recipient would be like the worker ID or something. For whatever reason, GitHub Actions has chosen to set that to the GitHub organization or user. I don't really know why. The thing is, this is configurable. So if you want to alter the audience, you can. If there's a reason behind it, I, I haven't come up with a good reason why, but if you want to, you do you. And then the last one is going to be the issuer. Who issued this token? So, and basically Vault needs to know that so it can go talk to that issuer and be like, did you issue this token? And you know, if it did, then life is good. So those are the three big claim fields that you need to be aware of. All right, now with that all out of the way, I think I got all the context nailed down. We're gonna go through a demo. Now I was told no live demos. I know, you're all sad. You, you can be sad with me, it's fine. Um, so instead I did screenshots, which is not as exciting, but I'll try to make it exciting. I'll dance if you need me to, that's fine. Um, before we get into what you'll see, let me set up what I'm trying to actually do here, which is to have when a push happens on the main branch of a repository, then it'll kick off a GitHub action. That action will authenticate against a auth method in Vault. It will get a new Vault token that is allowed to access a secret key value, and then it will access that secret key value and echo it out to the terminal. Now, fortunately, GitHub Actions is smart enough not to actually echo out the value because that would defeat the whole purpose, but we'll see that in a moment. So if you were doing this yourself, what would the steps look like to set it up? Well, you'd need a KV engine mounted with a secret in it in Vault. Also in Vault, you'd need to create a policy that allows access to that secret. That policy is going to be associated with a role and that role is going to be part of the OIDC or JWT authentication method. So those are the things we need to do on the vault side. What do I need to do over on the GitHub Actions side? Well, I need to set up some secrets for my GitHub Actions so it knows which vault server to talk to, which role it's going to be using, and what secret it's going to be accessing. And then I need to create a GitHub Actions workflow that supports all this stuff. And then I need to run that GitHub Actions to actually get the value. That's kind of the end goal. And then we're all going to profit, right? Like make lots of money? That's, that's how it works. No, okay. Um, all right, so these are the screenshots instead of the live demo. Uh, first thing I'm going to tell you is that if you are interested in trying this out yourself, you don't have to start from scratch. I got gotcha. you. I created a GitHub repository because I kind of had to anyway. But you have access to this too, it's not private. Um, the name of the GitHub repository, it's in my account, it's Ned1313, and the repository is called Vault OIDC GitHub Actions. I really tried to be as clear as possible with this. Um, if you're interested in trying it out, just go find this repository, go ahead and fork it into your account, and give it a test drive. You're also gonna need a Vault server, which I'll get to in a moment. In fact, I wrote a whole readme in here that tells you what you need to set up on the Vault server, what you need to set up on the GitHub Action server, and there's a Terraform script that'll do it for you. 
See, I tried to make this easy. Okay, so that's what's in the repository. And if you forget it, you know, just remember Ned 1313, and I'll try to remember to pin it as one of my repositories. Okay. Now I mentioned you need a vault server, and that should be fairly obvious that you do in fact need a vault server. And I chose to use HCP vault, because of course I did. No, there's actually a reason behind it, beyond just, you know, it's easy, um, which it is alarmingly easy to spin up a vault server. Um, the reason I use, chose to use HCP vault is if you think about it, GitHub Actions needs to reach out and talk to a vault server. That vault server needs a public address. I mean, you could run a hosted GitHub Actions uh, runner inside of a private network that can talk to a private vault server. Again, that's a lot of work to set up, and also I wanted you to be able to do this easily. So instead, HCP vault gives you that private endpoint, no muss, no fuss. So I did that, and I actually have a separate one here that's for a totally different thing that I'm not allowed to talk about, but OIDC demo is the one that we're going to be using, and because I'm lazy, I didn't set up any other authentication methods, so first thing I do is generate an admin token that I will use. Like, you know, don't do this in production, but it's a, it's a development server, it's fine. So I'll set that as my vault token. I also need the vault address. So I'll go back to the interface, and there's my public cluster URL that it generated for me with all the properly signed certificates and everything. Man, that's convenient. Boom, I'm gonna add that in. And because I'm using HCP Vault, one thing that if you've never used it before might throw you a little bit is that you're in the namespace, whether you want to be or not. So the namespace is called admin. You can create namespaces below that namespaces, and if you don't want know what vault namespaces are, then you can ask me after the presentation. That's a whole other topic. But the admin namespace is the default namespace you have to set if you're using HCP vault. If you got your own thing set up, you do you. Okay, so with all of that set up, I ran a few commands to look at my authentication methods. So here's my authentication methods, and I have jot and token, that's it. So that's why I had to use a token to log in. So JWT is set up, and I gave it a nice description so I know what it's for, and within there I configured the JOT authentication method with some key items. So what's in here? I'll point you to the beginning with the bound issuer. It sounds a little creepy, but what it actually means is who is going to be issuing the tokens that you're doing the authentication against, and because we're using GitHub Actions, there's a well-defined URL that you have to set this to. The only other value that matters in here is the OIDC discovery URL. Nine times out of 10, this is going to be exactly the same as the bound issuer, but if you were using something that's not GitHub Actions to, for the tokens, then it could potentially be something else. Also, if you're using GitHub Enterprise, it might be a little different too. So I have my configuration. Next thing I need to do is configure a role inside of my authentication method. This is the role that the GitHub Actions is going to ask for when it tries to authenticate to Vault. I called it GitHub Actions-Role. You probably want to use something more descriptive in production, like what's the actual repository that's logging in, um, so you'll know kind of what access to give it. But I just created one role because this was, I'm gonna try and keep it simple. All right. All right, and then this is the configuration of the role itself. So I'll point you at a few things inside here. Remember that audience value that I talked about earlier? Under bound audiences, I have me. HTTPS, github.com, Ned1313, it me. So that's the default audience that uh, the GitHub token service is going to add to the JOT. Like I said, that is configurable, so set this to whatever it is going to be. You might also notice there's some square brackets there because it's a list, it's audiences. So you could potentially be checking for different audiences for this role. The next thing I'll point to is the bound, well, the bound claims type. There's broadly two claims types here. There's string, which is just gonna match an exact string, and then there's also, I think it's glob, which Glob is the same thing as asterisk, which is the same thing as star. It's basically, I wanna support a wild card at the end of my string, as opposed to having it pinned to a specific branch, let's say. I didn't wanna do that. So for me, the bound subject is the repository, which starts with the repo keyword, colon, the repository, which is my username and the name of the repository, colon, then ref, and ref is 
What is it referring to within that repository? In this case, it is ref heads main, which is the main branch of my repository. So that's the exact subject it's looking for in the token. If the token that is sent by GitHub Actions doesn't have that subject or that audience, this whole thing falls apart and it won't be able to authenticate to this role. So you can imagine, like, the, the, the gears turn in your head a little bit of how you might apply this to your situation in your repositories and how wide of a role you want to create. The other thing I'll point to, <clears throat> excuse me, down here is under token policies. These are the policies that will be issued with the token that is given if the authentication is successful. So I've given it the policy GitHub Actions OIDC that has permissions on Vault to do things. Uh, I also set the TTL to one minute and 40 seconds, which means the token that it gets back when it tries to authenticate is gonna be good for 100 seconds, and that's it, which is nice. All right, I've really put some bounds around how long this access works for. It's kind of precisely what I would want. All right, so because I referenced a policy, here's the policy, it is alarmingly simple. Uh, I'm granting list and read access to the path tacos data sauce recipe, and so, there's the secrets list. I have a secrets, a KV secrets engine mounted at tacos and I wrote a secret to that called sauce recipe. And because it's V2 of the KV engine, the actual path is gonna be tacos slash data, not just tacos slash sauce recipe. If it was V1, then it would be without the data. And that's the whole metadata data thing. Again, we don't need to get into that not important to this conversation. So that's everything on the vault side. I set up my authentication method, I set up my policy, I set up the role in the authentication method, and I set up the secret that I'm gonna to try to access. Now I need to go over to GitHub and configure my repository secrets. And again, there's a Terraform script that does all of this for you, so you don't have to remember all of this. The values that I have to give it, the vault address. What vault server am I gonna go talk to? The vault namespace, that one's optional. I'm using HCP Vault, so I do need a Vault namespace there. If you're not using HCP Vault, you might not need a namespace. Vault role, this is going to be the role that I created that it's going to authenticate against. And then the secret key and path point to what secret am I trying to access. Now, if you weren't trying to access a secret, if you are, you weren't trying to access a static secret, if you were trying to generate, I don't know, dynamic credentials for a Terraform run, then you would put the path to that instead. So it's gonna depend on what you're actually doing within the workflow, but since we're accessing a secret, we need the path to it. So that's all the information you need in the repository. No sensitive information in here, no information that expires. This is just static config for this particular repository. And if you know GitHub Actions, uh, back up for a second, these are repository level secrets. GitHub, GitHub repositories also support environments. So if you wanna work with multiple environments, you can set the secrets at the environment level instead of at the repository level. So you might set vault address and namespace at the repository level and then the role secret and secret path at the environment level. Mix and match, whatever works for you. Okay, so that's what's in the secrets. Now we're getting into the workflow. If you've never seen a GitHub Actions workflow, you've seen one. This is it, and you give it a name, you tell it what triggers this. So that, where you see it says on push, it's gonna say trigger this when there's a push to any branch in this repository. Now I only have one branch, so it's gonna be on the main, but you can customize this based off of branch, um, pass within the branch, a whole bunch of stuff you can do. Again, you know, read the documentation, whatever. The next thing that's super important is the permissions. Now for, some, for a lot of GitHub Actions, you don't have to put in a permissions, but because we need it to generate a JWT that it's going to use, we have to give it some additional non-default permissions, and the big one is ID token write. Why is it write? Hmm, that's kind of weird, right? Like I'm, I, I'm, I'm asking for a token, wouldn't that be a read? I think the reason is because the actual requ request against the token service is a post, which would be considered a write. I mean, check my homework on that, but I think that's why it's a write. But regardless, you have to put in ID token write so it can get a token, and when you explicitly set permissions, then you have to explicitly set all permissions, so you also have to give it read access to the contents of the repository so it can copy it down to the runner. 
So that's what's happening in permissions. And then in the jobs, we're setting up our worker. I'm using a public worker, public worker that's running the latest Ubuntu. And then I have a series of steps it's gonna take. The first one just checks out the repository. That's in almost like every GitHub Actions. The next one's a special step for when you need to troubleshoot. And trust me, you're going to need to troubleshoot. The action that you use from that HashiCorp has created, which we'll see in a moment, doesn't really give you a whole lot of feedback about what went wrong. In fact, it gives you basically no feedback. It just says 504, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I wanna th personally thank um, Benjamin Panel from CR Networks for this, and I threw a link to his blog post that included this. He created this troubleshooting step, and basically it runs two different important commands. One grabs the token from the token service and then prints out the contents of the token so you can see what's actually in the token that's getting passed to Vault. And the other action runs a curl against the Vault endpoint with that token so that you can see the actual response from the Vault server. So those two things should really help you figure out where things are falling apart in your configuration. So thank you very much for that. Um, it also has the environment variables defined for the vault address, the path, and the role, which most of it's grabbing from the secrets that we set earlier. If you were running this in any kind of production capacity, you would remove this troubleshooting step because it exposes some sensitive information. And even though that information is time bound, you probably still don't want to expose it. All right. So we are now ready to use the action and the action is called HashiCorp slash vault action. And the current version when I tried this was 2.4.0, might be a newer version now. Um, and then there's a with stanza that basically passes parameters to the action. And those parameters are going to include the method. We're using JWT authentication. So you're telling it what auth method to use, the URL of your vault server, the namespace, and that's optional. Again, if you're not using namespaces, you can actually leave that blank and it'll just ignore it. The role that you're going to be authenticating against, and then the secrets that you want to pull. Now, if you're not just pulling static secrets, if you're doing something else, then read the documentation. There's information in there on how to go about it. But for this, we're just grabbing a single secret. So I include the secret path, the secret key, and then I am sending it to a, uh, output called my secrets. And then in the next step, I'm running an echo command that should echo out the contents of the my secret output from the previous step. So let's actually trigger that. How do I go about that? Well, there is a directory called trigger action in there that has a file called change me. So all you got to do is change it to something else. I changed it to, um, Vault is a burrito, and the reason I say that is because if Terraform is a taco, as we all know it is, then Vault is probably a burrito because it's all sealed up, and I actually have a little Vault burrito right here. How about that? If you want one of these, uh, visit the Riverpoint uh, Technologies booth down in the Expo Hall, and I've got a bunch of those. You can help yourself. Um, so I changed the text to Vault is a burrito, and then I committed it, and that kicked off the workflow update change me. Um, Let's look at what's actually in the workflow. Okay, so it went through all of my steps successfully, which, trust me, the first 50 times I ran this, it did not get through all these steps successfully. Not even close. Every time I try to do something with GitHub Actions, it's just a sea of red for a while, and then it goes all green, and then I get worried that it went all green because there's no way I got it right yet. In this case, I did. It actually worked. And it worked because I had this troubleshooting step in here. So this is the information that gets printed out by the troubleshooting step that's in there, and it includes the full contents of that JWT token. So the subject matches exactly the bound subject that I had in the role that I set up on Vault. Perfect. The audience matches the audience that I set up for bound audiences. And lastly, the issuer, the ISS down towards the bottom, matches the issuer that I set for the authentication method itself. But when I was first doing this, it didn't match up and it failed and this helped me go, oh, okay, I get it now. I'm gonna have to change something. So it prints out all that information and then it tries to use that token and you get the full login response from Vault. 
Now, in this case, you can actually see in plain text the client token that gets returned, which again is why you don't want to leave this in production, right? This is just purely for troubleshooting. I'm getting this up and running. Take this troubleshooting step out, please. Um, but it shows you the request ID, all the information about it, and also the fact that it's capped at 100 seconds because by default, the action is going to request a one hour token but you can cap that by setting a max TTL on the actual uh, role itself. So that's what I did. It gets 100 seconds to use the secret. It uses about one second to access the secret, which is the next step. And so for that step, there we go. Now, one thing that totally threw me the first time I ran this was the Kubernetes token path. Because what? I'm not using Kubernetes. We haven't even talked about Kubernetes. I mean, I, this is a talk in 2022, so I have to mention Kubernetes at least. I'm pretty sure that's a law, but I'm not using Kubernetes. Well, it turns out it just adds this by default. The action does, and if you're not using Kubernetes, it doesn't matter. Okay, that's fine. But it definitely threw me through a loop the first time. So this is the uh, actual run, and it was successful because I don't see any errors. So uh, if I did see errors, it would be a very basic error that doesn't tell me much, which again, that's why the troubleshooting step is there. And then lastly, I print the secret and the secret comes out as stars because GitHub Actions is like, no, that's secret data. Why would I print that out to the console? You must be mad. So it won't do it. I say thank you for that. Same thing you'll notice that the URL is blanked out and the namespace, that's because it came from the secrets that are stored inside of the GitHub repository. When you use those, it's not going to print them out in plain text because they're secrets. Thank you, GitHub, for saving me from myself. So, I mean, that's the entire workflow, right? You can see how I can use GitHub Actions with this authentication and a specific role set up to access Vault and then do something else. I'll also mention that this authentication method works with much more than just Vault. Right? Any service that supports OIDC and JOT authentication workflows is able to work with GitHub Actions. And they have good documentation around using this with Azure and actually have a video on my YouTube channel about that. You know, if you want to check it out, that's fine. Uh, AWS is supported, GCP is supported, and then also any generic OIDC uh, provider as long as you can get the necessary information like the issuer and the subject, et cetera, all the stuff we just talked about, as long as you can configure all of that properly, it'll work with whatever that service is. So now you no longer need to store static credentials in your GitHub repository. Stop doing it. So um, that's going to do it for me. That's my whole talk. Again, I'm Ned Bellavance, Ned1313 on Twitter. My web website is nedinthecloud.com. If you have questions about this, you want to be reminded of the URL, whatever it is, I'll be out there, happy to take questions. Uh, but that's going to do it for me. Thank you very much, everybody.